Hello and welcome to another session of Groundbreakers Live. I'm your host, Javed Mohammed, and I'm very honored to have this Kevin Wittek, who is a Oracle Groundbreaker ambassador. He's doing his uh, PhD and also leading uh, a research team in the field of blockchain. Kevin, welcome. Hi, Javed. Very happy to be uh, virtually here with you. <laughs> well, you, you seem like you're all dressed to go on vacation or to Hawaii or someplace. Uh, where, where, which city, where, where are you? So I'm in Gelsenkirchen in Germany, in West Germany. But uh, actually when I started my PhD, I changed my clothing style a little bit. And basically since then, uh, I'm nearly exclusively wearing uh, Hawaii shirts now oh, for whatever it. reason. So okay. there are some cool computer scientists who wear Hawaii shirts. Also like Grady Woodrow, who is who he's from Hawaii. It, okay, it, but It makes it very lively and... It's it's just uh, it's, uh, I love it. So uh, <laughs> cool. Thanks for bringing the color in uh, for the day. Um, so we were talking a little bit off camera. So actually, you, it, it's interesting that you're working on, on your PhD. But you're like most people go from academia into industry, and you've actually done the reverse. So I'm just kind of curious. Can you share a little bit about why you did that? Yeah, it's a good question. So I was working a couple of years in as a normal software engineer, mostly in cybersecurity after my master's, as I did the master's. And I never thought I would go back to university because I thought at the end it was boring. I wanted to build stuff and so on and be more of an engineer. But then to a certain degree, maybe because of my wife, because she was doing her PhD and I was also collaborating with her on some academic work. And I really, I don't know, got inspired by science and research again. And so this kind of was in my mind suddenly, like, oh, how would it be to be a kind of a researcher again? And then I got an opportunity from my old professor to come come back and um, build up this group in the institute about blockchain research and at the same time do my phd and i thought okay this is kind of sounds cool like building a team but also doing my phd like trying to uh, employ or, or implement all those ideas i got from software engineering from from agile from open source into science to see what it can bring to this field and um, yeah that, that was the idea and um, so what I learned, like some things you can bring there, but a lot of things are very different. It's a lot of work to change the culture or the rules by which science works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. So you're part of the EMEA Virtual 2020 Groundbreakers Tour. Uh, and you have a presentation of blockchain through the looking glass. So um, give us a sense, first of all, just kind of just step back and you know, where, where are we at? Obviously, we've been hearing about blockchain. For those of, for many people out there, the only kind of exposure they have to blockchain is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we know there's a lot more to it than that. But just give us a, if you just kind of step back, where are we at if, in, terms of an, uh, in, in terms of the adoption cycle of blockchain? So... Um, shortly after I started my, my work in the blockchain field as part of my PhD, which was middle of last year, I, I started to, to look into like this Gartner hype, hype cycle with okay. regards to uh, blockchain. And um, many people would say we are over the first uh, hype peak and like going down into this uh, valley of depression or whatever. But it seems we are uh, around, um, through this already. So it's going up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And... Um, so I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency actually is a, a production system. So it is live and it is usable and it's still speculative in a certain way, but it is, it is there and it's running and it's a productive system. Um, the other things um, we, are, we are now seeing is a lot of um, enterprise use cases that go in the direction of supply chain. I mm -hmm. think it makes a lot of sense there, but I'm, I'm personally still uh, clinging on to this original vision of blockchains as a as public networks as public decentralized networks and that's what i find most interesting it's something that builds on top of the internet or maybe is, even improves the internet in certain ways mm -hmm. And this is what, what inspires me most and what I want to see most. And I hope we, we will see some things there with regards to 
um, digital identities. This is a big field where we see a lot of progress, especially in the European Union now. And uh, other topics are, are in, the, in the realm of science, even open science, open data and, and um, copyright and those kind of things and higher digitalization with things that can be public by design, where the data can be public, but it should be public and immutable and so on. Yeah. Okay. So take us, and uh, you use the word looking glass. I was just going to say, take us, if you open the hood, what do you see? So if one was to look at a, a you know, at a blockchain implement solution, what, 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 what would they see? I mean, obviously it may not be physical parts and everything, but uh, yeah, what, what things constitute a, block, a blockchain solution? Yeah, so um, it is... Uh, at, at the core, maybe what most people think about, it is this blockchain data structure, this blocks that are chained together, always by using the previous block as an input to the hash of the next block together with the data. So this is the data structure. But now if you just think about this data structure, it is a, a single object. It's, it's somewhere in, in a solitary state. But that's not, that's not blockchain. Blockchain also brings a network to a table. So you have this data structure that is synchronized over a network, over a protocol, this is a consensus protocol, mm -hmm. that uh, allows this distributed network to reach the same, the same eventual state at a certain point in time. Uh -huh. And um, this whole thing is like highly, highly self-automated. So a, ve a very self-regulating system, I would say, yes. Okay. And, and and what are some of the challenges of keeping this, you know, this this distributed network trusted, and to make sure that you know people are not uh, going in and changing stuff or you know hacking into it. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge is at the at the start, like the design phase of the software that would use a blockchain. That already here you have to think about um, things like like user privacy, GDPR, and so on. That um, so you can never delete the data, and the data can potentially leak to everyone, or is even publicly visible to everyone. So you already have to keep this totally in mind and be very careful about the things that you actually write onto the blockchain. So in general, we would not write the data itself on the blockchain. We maybe write cryptographic fingerprints on the blockchain or we combine a cryptographic fingerprint with a link to the actual data, like these kind of things, um, and not the data itself and already having this in mind when designing the system. And then even if you if you just write cryptographic fingerprints, if someone um, just writes other stuff that is mm -hmm. potentially a violation of someone's privacy, and then mm -hmm. so in the European Union we have the GDPR, and then someone can request this data to be deleted. So how do you do this in an mm -hmm. international blockchain network? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't actually <laughs> like laws and the technical realities clash then and. Uh, these are kind of open questions still in, uh, in, in, in blockchain. Okay. So you mentioned uh, at the start that, you know, we kind of passed the, the first hype cycle and, you know, s somewhere along the line in terms of adoption. I'm just kind of trying to see if, can you paint a picture of, of a future where blockchain is pervasive and it's out there? What, what does a world like that look like? So, uh, I, I think it, this brings maybe two properties to society or the technical part of society. The one is a higher degree of digitalization and automation, which I think we as technologists, technologists want. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, by still having decentralized systems that are not controlled by centralized entities, by centralized big tech companies, but instead by a network or maybe a network of governments or whatever mm -hmm. and this would um, like especially looking from a german perspective where we have a lot of processes not 100 percent digitized would allow like citizens to do a lot of the things they when they interact with governments do it in a secure and digitized way that at the, at the same time is very secure like censorship resistant and so on and potentially this can unlock 
also other I don't know dynamics in in systems where everything becomes a uh, gets a digital identity. So objects can get digital identities, but also digital assets can get digital as, uh, identities, and kind of this new network of digital identities talking with each other, but everything like the internet itself, not controlled by um, big corporations, but by a distributed network. This is what I would envision with it. Okay, well, it's a fascinating uh, future. Kevin, I really appreciate you taking the time to sh share with us and uh, um, all the best. Aloha. Ja, aloha. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen.